Good morning, and thank you all so much for being here. This promises to be a very informative uh, presentation and at a great time. So we are so glad that you could be here with us. A couple of things I wanted to share before we got started. I wanted to let you know that we will be recording this town hall today, and we will be uploading it to our website either later today or later this week. So you can share it, rewatch it, whatever you'd like. Also, as you may have noticed, we have you muted this morning. You will not be allowed to unmute just for the sake of order, but we do have the chat line open. Um, it's on the toolbar. Um, it's that little chat. It's just a little bubble. Um, so click that and you should be able to type to everyone. Um, please feel free to ask any questions or any comments that you have. Um, and our panel should get to those after the presentation that they have set up for today. So thank you all. Thank Thank you all of you on our panel for joining us this morning. It is such an honor to have you all. Um, and I'm gonna hand things off to Paula Wolfson, manager of Avenues Care Partners, who will be helping me moderate today's session and to introduce our panel of doctors. Thanks, Kat. So I wanna begin by simply thanking all our first responders in our local area. I'm part of this incredible network of elder care professionals. We have three physicians from Stanford, very busy donating their time to be with us today. And it's been a hard long year for all of us. And we know that. So there's a lot of feelings we have coming today to talk about vaccines and the rollout. It's very complicated. I was up at five today reading CNN to see if anything new was coming our way. And I think we're at that point where we kind of know there will be more vaccines. We're opening it up in California to 65 plus, but it's the actual rollout and the timing that is so frustrating and hard and also very difficult for seniors how to access, especially if you are not computer savvy. Um, so there is a lot to talk about and I'm going to ask that everybody be very patient and that we um, just listen and learn from our uh, presentation today and then uh, have our questions. And if you have more questions, you can send them to me uh, at Avenidas. We'll, we'll post all our contact information and we'll just keep this dialogue going. We always are open to dialogue. And so first of all, I just want to introduce Dr. Marina Martin, who I've had the pleasure to meet and work with over the few years I've been with Avenidas. And I have her bio and I've learned more about her than I knew yesterday. So she graduated from UCLA School of Med in 2003 and then from Stanford Internal Medicine Residency in 2006 and began serving as chief resident from 2006 to 07. And then she began a three year fellowship in the Stanford Prevention Research Center and then became medical director of Stanford Student Free a, a run free clinic, Pacific Free Clinic, which provides preventative health services to low income uninsured adults in the East San Jose area. And then she went into her research fellowship and she volunteered in interdisciplinary geriatric medicine clinic at the Palo Alto VA hospital, which kindled her interest in working with older adults. Now as an aside, I always ask my doctors and speakers why they went into geriatric medicine. I think there's a story here, an untold story of who becomes a geriatrician and why and what happened in their families and why they think it's important to be in this field of medicine. And we need more geriatricians, we really do. And so eventually with many years of hard work, she became the, the director of the Stanford Senior Clinic. I refer new clients of mine to that clinic all the time. And in 2015, she became the first section chief of Stanford's new section of geriatric medicine in the School of Medicine. So in honor of Dr. Martin, and I cannot see myself on the screen right now because the message about this is being recorded is still in the middle of our screen. Kat, I'm wondering if you can get rid of that. It's just right in the middle of our screen. Oh. Um, and can you take that down? I think you just need to click that you accept that, Paula, and it'll disappear. Oh, there you go. Okay, so in honor of the women here today and that Dr. Martin, you are section chief, I am wearing my inaugural pearls, <laughs> your honor. <laughs> so, Thank you. <laughs> and a few weeks ago, Dr. Martin called and said, Paula, would Avenida like to work with two geriatric medicine fellows for speaking venues? And I said, of course. 
So now we have with us today, Dr. Caroline Park, who speaks Korean, is an interested in um, aging and longevity and fragility, and Dr. Alice Mao, yep. who is um, a geriatric fellow, speaks conversational Mandarin, and is interested in uh, the COVID vaccine, depression, and isolation during the pandemic. So thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to take myself off the screen, and then I'll come back in for the Q&A. Thank you so much, uh, Paula, for the introduction. Um, yes, I'm very lucky today to be joined by two of our physician fellows at Stanford, who um, Dr. Mao and Dr. Park, who are spending an extra year this year training in geriatric medicine, having trained previously in internal medicine. Um, so now they will be specialists in care of older adults um, mm -hmm. and conditions that are more common as we get older. Um, and they'll both be staying around this area for ongoing practice and study. So we're, we're very grateful. Um, and we decided today that three is better than one when it comes to as big a topic as the vaccines. Um, and so we will be um, presenting some slides, but we'll be pausing a lot as we go for some questions and then have a lot of time for question and answer afterwards as well. Um, we realize this is a, has been, we acknowledge it's been incredibly hard, uh, this vaccine rollout and frustrating. Um, no less for us uh, than anyone else. And we um, continue to lose patients um, that we've cared for to COVID and feel very um, passionate about getting this going as soon as possible and doing the right thing. And that said, we totally, um, you know, I'm involved in some of the work trying to figure out how to roll this out and it, it, there are a lot of barriers and challenges. So we can definitely talk about those today as well. Um, so Dr. Mao is gonna start us off sharing some slides um, with some basic information. We're gonna start a little bit at the beginning, but eventually get more into details and then about the distribution as well. And Dr. Park is taking over at some point. Anyway, please feel free to chat questions as things go along and we'll do our best to keep an eye on that as well. Perfect, thank you, Dr. Martin. I'm gonna share my screen um, and I'm gonna ask folks if they can see my slides. Thumbs up, perfect, great. And everyone's hearing me okay? Okay, perfect. Um, Hello everyone. Again, my name is Alice Mao. I'm a geriatric medicine fellow. Um, you know, it's such a pleasure for um, Caroline, me, and Dr. Martin to be with you here today. Um, this is a super important topic, um, and uh, you know, I just want to say that we um, are giving this talk sort of with the best um, knowledge that we know. We're not infectious disease experts, um, but our hope is to deliver to you guys a sense of sort of, um, you know, some basic nuts and bolts about the vaccines. Not everyone understands um, how the vaccines are made, what goes into them. Um, we hope to answer a little bit of questions about those and then talk a little bit about access to the vaccines. Here's our roadmap. Um, we'll spend a little bit of time um, talking about the background of COVID-19 and the vaccine landscape. Uh, we'll go over sort of just uh, some nuts and bolts of um, what it takes to develop a vaccine so everyone can be on the same page about that. Um, Dr. Park will take us uh, through a brief review of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, which are now approved um, for emergency authorization use here. Um, and then Dr. Martin will talk to us about access to vaccines. Throughout the presentation, we'll have um, breaks for questions. Um, so feel free to type your questions in the chat. One of us will take a look um, and try to address them. And then there will definitely be time for question and answer later uh, at the end of the presentation as well. All right. So, you know, I think I'm preaching to the choir um, when I say that the COVID-19 pandemic has been devastating for us all. Um, as of today, there have been uh, 100 million confirmed cases of COVID worldwide, uh, 2.1 million deaths worldwide. And here in the US, uh, we have over 25 million cases 
and 425,000 deaths as of today. Um, and just to say that the number of cases and deaths here in the US have really doubled since they were uh, about a month ago. And so I think Dr. Fauci was right when he said that this was gonna be a pretty rough winter um, in terms of COVID. Uh, here uh, is just a little graph of the number of deaths per 100,000 people um, it, uh, for COVID in every country. And we here in the US rank fourth. Um, so things are challenging. Um, and I think it goes without saying too that it's not just about the hospitalizations and the mortality, but also that um, the economic effects are devastating and we really feel it in our communities. However, with that said, you know, the silver lining um, and the hope on the horizon is really the uh, vaccines that are coming. Um, they, I just wanna acknowledge that worldwide, there have been um, many, many vaccines in the pipeline for development. Um, uh, this is a nice article by the New York Times that gets updated daily um, that tracks how many vaccines are in phase one, phase two, phase three are in limited use. Right now it's eight. How many are approved um, and how many have been abandoned? Um, and of course, the one that's uh, biggest in the press that we hear about are the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, which have been approved for emergency authorization use here in the US um, and as well as in Europe. So we'll spend a little bit of time talking about those, but you may hear about other vaccines as well. And just to say that there's a broad landscape of vaccines across the world being developed and being in use. Uh, I like this photo because this is uh, the first patient or first individual uh, that got the Pfizer vaccine in the UK um, when it was first approved in the EU. This is Maggie Keenan. Uh, she's 90 years old. Um, she was the first to volunteer um, and get the Pfizer vaccine on December 8th. She's a, a uh, shop, uh, a jewelry shop assistant, um, and she was just super excited um, to be able to be the pioneer in getting this vaccine. And I also just really like her winter outfit. It's very, uh, very festive. Here is um, just a, a picture of um, the pipeline of how a vaccine gets developed. So just to sort of remind us all, you know, what really goes into developing a vaccine and what that process looks like, especially for the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. Typically, um, when we develop a vaccine, we sequence uh, the genome of the target, uh, the virus, and then we um, figure out what piece of that is going to be useful to make a vaccine. And that all happens in the discovery and target validation stage. Once we've identified a target and turned it into a vaccine candidate, it goes through a preclinical stage where it's tested um, in cells and animal models to make sure that it actually develops an immune response. Then there's a manufacturing process um, to make it a viable candidate. And then it goes into the phase one, two, and three trials that we often hear about. So a phase one trial um, in simple language is just a part of the study, a, a study that looks at, is this vaccine candidate safe? Um, it's usually tested in a handful of healthy volunteers, and then the side effects are observed. Once it's deemed to be safe, then the vaccine passes through to what's called a phase two trial. And here we have now hundreds of volunteers and participants who are tested. And the questions we're asking here is one, still safety is it still safe in a broader group of people. And then two, um, does it have immunogenicity, which is a basically big word to say, does it produce an immune response like we want it to? And then once uh, it's deemed to be safe, it produces an immune response, then we get to the sort of big phase three part of things, which uh, is where the vaccine is tested on thousands of people, uh, still looking for safety, but really now the question is efficacy. Is this effective in doing what it, we wanted to do, which in this case means preventing uh, COVID-19 disease? 
And once it's able to clear all three trials, then um, it can go through a regulatory process to be approved for emergency authorization use um, or for um, true approval um, to be uh, in use by the regulatory body. And each country has one, ours is the FDA. And so you may have heard in the news that, you know, the uh, vaccine development process has been uh, quite expedited in comparison because oftentimes this process takes a handful of years to potentially even a decade. Um, and just to sort of get a better understanding of uh, how that came about, especially for the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, we knew that the genome of uh, SARS-CoV-2 was sequenced and shared with the world on January 10th and that the first trial of participants were vaccinated in March. So, you know, just a few days after um, COVID came to U.S. soil. Um, and then um, from there, sort of this whole sequence to emergency uh, uh, approval for uh, emergency authorization use in the U.S. happened in the time of a little shy of a year. And um, you know, to, and understandably, there's a lot of questions about, well, you know, how was this expedited? Were there uh, steps step, uh, skipped in this process? Um, and the answer is no. From the preclinical stage to phase one, two, and three, both the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines had to clear all of these steps. Now, the reason that it was expedited is one, there was a lot of global partnerships um, and a lot of funding from global governments uh, in trying to uh, invest resources in making this as efficient of a process as possible in cutting out a lot of the bureaucratic processes that usually exist, um, sharing of data that happens sort of in lightning speed um, and then also the other part is that some of these phases could be combined. And so um, often uh, you'll see trials that say phase one, two, that means they combine the phase one and two trials uh, where they tested the safety. And then once it was deemed safe, they pretty quickly uh, moved on to the phase two part and incorporated more participants to make sure it was safe and produce an immune response or a combined phase two and three trial sort of with a similar idea. Um, so that's how that process was more expedited. And then a little bit of understanding about sort of, we hear that both vaccines are mRNA vaccines. Um, and what does that exactly mean? What exactly is an mRNA vac uh, vaccine? So the idea of using mRNA as a vaccine is not a completely new idea. It was actually discovered in 1990 and really perfected over the last decade as we were, scientists was looking at SARS and MERS and Zika virus. But the way that it works is that uh, scientists identify a part of the virus that might be useful as a target. So in this case, the coronavirus has on its surface these spike proteins, which are little proteins um, that uh, allow the virus to enter the body. And it's also the part of the virus that gets presented to the body as foreign. And so this is a part that really generates an immune response. It sends the alarm to the body that, hey, there's a foreigner here. And so scientists was able to figure out the messaging RNA, so sort of the part of the instructions to make this protein um, in order and package it in a nanoparticle uh, in order for it to be a vaccine. And so the messenger RNA does not get incorporated into our body's DNA, but it's more like a sticky note um, that allows the body to know how to make these spike proteins. Um, and so that the rest of the body and the immune system can react and respond and really build the antibodies, um, the T cells, the B cells, uh, that once there is a real coronavirus that comes along with its spike proteins, we already have the artillery to defend the body. Um, and then, you know, why um, mRNA vaccines uh, now, um, it, you know, and what makes this a really good candidate and what are some challenges with mRNA vaccines? Um, 
it used to be that vaccines were made um, from either a weakened virus, um, like the polio vaccine, or a part of the virus um, that has uh, little to no harm to the body. But as you can imagine, um, when you are trying to produce a bunch of weakened viruses or particles, that can be a really time and labor intensive and potentially dangerous thing to produce at scale. So the nice thing about the mRNA technology is that it can be produced really quickly and efficiently at scale for kind of a wartime effort against a pandemic. Um, so that's the nice thing about the mRNA. Now, what is the drawback? Um, because mRNA uh, doesn't really, um, it's not very stable in a regular environment. It kind of needs sort of a perfect environment in order to stay intact. That's why you'll hear that it needs sort of these special refrigerators to keep it at lower temperatures in order to be able to be shelf stable. And so, you know, whether certain countries use mRNA vaccines or not sort of also depends on their ability to get these uh, sort of refrigerators and to be able to transport them. So I'll stop there um, and uh, ask if there are any burning questions that are, are coming up before I pass it on to Dr. Park to talk about uh, the differences between the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine. Do have a couple of great questions in the chat. So I'll start with the first one. Um, so Bob Shaw asks, I've heard that having a physiological reaction to the vaccine is an indicator of its effectiveness. And this is commonly stated out there that if you have a strong reaction in terms of um, you know, fever chills, some of the uh, some of those kinds of symptoms, it might mean that your body's producing a stronger immune response. Um, and we don't know is the short answer, right? Dr. Al Dr. Mao and Dr. Park. Um, definitely having an anaphylactic reaction, an allergic type reaction has nothing to do with its effectiveness in terms of protecting you against COVID infection. Um, that is a reaction typically to one of the components in the vaccine mixture that stabilizes those nanoparticles. So that's nothing to do with immune response. We do anecdotally there, and probably, I think there's probably data on this now already, younger people do seem to have stronger responses after the second uh, dose in particular, um, in terms of symptoms of aches, fatigue, um, chills, things like that, then, older pa patients. And we do know that as we get older, our immune systems um, may not be as effective, but that doesn't mean we know that people who don't have a strong reaction um, are not as protected. We, we know that in this trial, these trials, which included a lot of people older than 65, fortunately, um, that effectiveness was pretty high. <laughs> like in the 80s and 90s uh, percentage. So even in older people, this worked really well. And they didn't necessarily, they didn't, weren't able to determine whether people with strong side effects were having a better, have a better protective reaction. So it's, that's a theoretical um, issue. We're just not sure. And if I, I might add, um, I'm just going to show you very quickly. Um... Some uh, that one part of the Moderna um, paper data, um, and as, as you can see in this figure, the main figure, these are the local and systemic uh, side effects after receiving the first or second dose in response to either a placebo dose or, for example, uh, the Moderna mRNA vaccine. And um, the colors here, grade one, two, and three, mean severity of the side effect symptoms. And so you can see that there is this huge wide range of variability in patients who have a very mild uh, symptom symptom of even for pain um, versus those that think that uh, the pain was severe and the same for other local uh, reactions like redness, swelling, um, and maybe some lymphadenopathy, swelling of the lymph nodes and tenderness there. Um, but I just wanted to point out that, you know, you can see that for everyone, for as Dr. Martin was saying, for the many, many numbers of patients who were getting either the first or second dose, there is a wide range of variability um, in the immunogenic response that 
then manifests itself into either a local or systemic event. But just because you have a strong uh, um, feeling of pain or a lot of swelling um, or versus none, th that really, we, we don't have any evidence um, that that's really corresponding to the level of immune immunogenicity or the amount of antibodies that you do produce in response to the vaccine. That's something that needs, it is a good question and needs uh, further study. But right now I would say that there's a lot of variability and we don't know. Yeah, and it seems to be effective regardless. <laughs> so that's good news actually, we're happy about that, um, of whether you have major side effects. Bob also asks, are there any insights about, oop, I lost it, sorry, when the slides moved. Are there any insights about what might be the long-term effects of the vaccine? Do you wanna answer that one, Dr. Mao? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, so, you know, one of the things that we don't have a complete understanding of is sort of what happens in sort of these rare uh, side effects of the vaccine for past a year or two years or multiple years. We know that from observing the participants um, who've gone through the trials now, uh, that for the most part, these common uh, side effects that Dr. Park will talk about, sort of headache, fatigue, um, you know, muscle aches and pains um, that we expect, mm -hmm. that they're pretty short-lived. Um, and even some of the very rare things um, like Bell's palsy, which is sort of a neurological um, issue where one side of your face feels uh, numb, that that may actually be pretty comparable um, to placebo. And uh, we know from studying other vaccines that if um, the very rare effects that we haven't seen to this sort of stage would be truly very rare. But I think we, we just don't have the data for, you know, what are the super rare things that are gonna happen for people for years to come. Um, I think I wanna highlight Dr. Martin's point about allergies. There are uh, a, a very few number of people that may have an allergic reaction to this. So if you already have, um, anaphylaxis or major allergies to anything else um, and have an EpiPen, it's worthwhile carrying that with you just in case um, when you get your vaccine. Um, but otherwise, sort of the outside of the co uh, common sort of headaches, fatigue, um, chills and muscle aches, um, there haven't been anything else that's um, that, that we can see. Um, that's yeah. truly a signal. And that's been true of most vaccines through, or pretty many, much all, all vaccines through history, especially ones that did not contain any live virus, is that the long-term effects are minimal to absent. There really are not long-term effects from, from vaccines that have been scientifically demonstrated. We don't expect there to be any major long-term effects from this vaccine either. Um, I saw another question, speaking of long-term effects, yeah. about the durability of the vaccine and what we know about that. And that's a really good question. Um, we do know that uh, from a paper that Moderna published looking at four-month data from the antibody response from the uh, first wave of participants that were vaccinated, that their um, antibodies uh, still remain high and they so that suggests that there is still durable response uh, uh, from the vaccine and durable protection but in terms of you know how long that tr lasts truly right now we haven't seen it wane but I think that will sort of borne yeah. out as time comes exactly yeah so the antibody levels seem to stay high um, as far out as we can know right now. And until more time passes, we won't be able to know if they last a year or 10 years, or um, we just have to wait for that amount of time to pass. But so far the indications are good and that they do seem to be having only a very slight decrease at four months um, in levels of antibodies. So that's a good sign. Um, Bill's asking about side effects. Do people with uh, allergies have people with allergies have had side effects and asking if non-allergic rhinitis or runny nose, essentially, is that a known side effect of the vaccine? It's certainly not one that's been called to great attention, partly because it's so common, <laughs> I'm guessing, uh, whether or not you get a vaccine. Um, so I'm not aware, I don't know if Dr. Mao or Park, I don't think it's, it's considered a major vaccine side effect. 
It's not. And I think this is actually a perfect segue for Dr. Park um, to start her portion about sort of the more specific details about the efficacy and the side effects of the vaccine. And we'll get to the rest of the questions later, especially we have a whole section on getting appointments and um, all of those things. Okay. So um, I will first go through the results of the Pfizer vaccine. I know this is a very um, busy slide, but the point to um, uh, make out of this is this uh, very nice figure over here, uh, highlighting the effectiveness of the, va of the vaccine um, in terms of reporting the cumulative incidence of who actually got COVID um, of the ones who had uh, the vaccination. And so you can clearly see the incidence of COVID-19, um, symptomatic COVID-19 uh, is almost, non-existent um, in the patients who did receive the vaccine versus those um, who uh, received the placebo injection. Um, and so this uh, ca was calculated to be about 95% uh, protective um, against symptomatic COVID. And again, um, this is actually a very important study that because it actually uh, was based on individuals who did not have COVID. Um, and then next slide, please. So for the Moderna vaccine, um, similar results were also seen. As you can see the trend, um, the mRNA vaccine was about 94% um, protective uh, against symptomatic COVID. Um, and if you look here on the right-hand side corner, you can see in the placebo, especially in terms of severe COVID uh, infections um, requiring ICU stays and ventilations, you can see zero uh, in the mRNA vaccination group versus 30 in the placebo. Um, and the difference between 185 symptomatic COVID versus uh, 11 um, is also very dramatic. Um. So uh, in terms of the timeline though, um, someone, people have already asked like how long does this last? And we had just, uh, and Dr. Mao had just um, told us also about the Moderna vaccine being studied for up to uh, four months. And it seemed to be between four to six months um, is still, we don't have any data beyond six months right now, um, but the immunogenic titers, the antibody levels seem to be sustained up to that level. Um, and how early do you get, how much early do, um, do you get the um, protection for from um, the vaccination? Well, for the Pfizer dose, um, they reported after the first dose, just 12 days after the first dose, you do achieve immunity. Um, and then after the second dose, it's even quicker, seven days. And then for the Moderna vaccine, they report about 14 days after the first dose, you are uh, completely immune. Um, so next slide, please. So when you compare the, um, uh, the two vaccines themselves, as I was mentioning, the Pfizer uh, and the Moderna vaccine are both uh, tested in individuals who are either 16 or 18 or older. Um, and they had some stable chronic medical diseases, but not on immunosuppressive medicines, including um, strong dose steroids um, and other disease modifying therapies that are uh, commonly used for autoimmune disorders. Um, and then they had to have not have uh, had COVID. Um, and we did not test, they didn't test uh, pregnant or breastfeeding um, individuals as well. And as, as I was telling you, uh, it was tested to be about 95 and 94% effective. Now, next slide, please. The side effects, we, which we were just discussing, um, include those that are local versus whole body reactions. And the most local, um, common local um, side effects effect were pain at the injection site, which usually goes uh, away within one to two days. Um, and then there were some systemic whole body reactions that were reported, um, but those seem to be uh, more prominent in the younger group than in the older um, participants. Um, and it happened usually after the second dose more than the first. Um, and of the more commonly reported systemic side effects, that means whole body tiredness, fatigue, uh, lingering headache, a lot of um, body aches and muscle everywhere, and then perhaps some fevers and chills. Um, next slide, please. I think time for more yeah. questions. Dr. Yeah, more Park. questions. Um, so here's yeah. one from Joanne. How do scientists know when the vaccine has gone bad? And I'm guessing that means when it's uh, expired or not useful anymore. If I understood that right, Joanne, please feel free to clarify if I didn't get that right. I presume that's pretty much what it means. And before they um, discovered that this requires, uh, you know, minus 70 degree um, 
uh, Celsius uh, refrigeration um, for a certain number of hours or that its shelf life is not good, um, maybe let's say after two hours at room temperature, um, is because they did a lot of what's called in vitro studies, not in human, but outside um, the human body. They tested the stability of this um, packaged mRNA vesicle um, to see if that would be effective in being able to produce um, the viral protein that we want it to make out of the body. And they tested that outside the uh, body in, in cell culture dishes. And so that's how um, scientists knew that we need um, this minus 70 degree temperature to preserve this mRNA. And as Dr. Mao was saying, that, that's because of the inherent instability of the RNA itself compared to DNA, which we'll talk about later too. Yeah. Definitely. I do see here. So there's a question about getting appointments. We'll talk about that in a, in a little bit, but there's a question directed directly to me about the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. And a second question about the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. I know I saw in here, um, Joanna Benz is saying it's now under FDA review. Um, and that this technology has already been used for vaccine development in the U S military. Would that potentially be safe for long-term? Um, and also she likes the fact that it only needs one dose. Um, I fall in the 65 plus, but not 75 plus age category. Would it be worthwhile to wait for the Johnson and Johnson? Uh, that's the Janssen pharmaceuticals vaccine. What do you think Dr. Barr? Okay, so let me once again um, share my screen that has the data of the, <laughs> of the um, Johnson and Johnson. So uh, is everybody able to see the screen? Um, so this paper was actually just published uh, about, uh, I guess, uh, 10 days ago or so. Um, and uh, to answer your question a bit, so this is, uh, it looked at 30,000 patients um, aged between 18 and 55, um, and then another cohort of 65 and older. We don't have data yet, though, about whether or not this uh, vaccine is going to be rolled out as a single dose regimen or two dose regimen. That data is still pending. And in the end, Interim right now, we, we can't say for sure that this is for sure a single dose uh, vaccination. The reason the the reason why people are saying that uh, or understanding that this may be a single dose regimen is because when we tested when these. Uh, when the Johnson Johnson vaccine was tested in non-human primates, they seem to have about 98% effectiveness and immunogenicity after just one dose. And so that's based on non-human primate studies, not based on human studies. So um, when they looked at, whoops, yeah slide is not advancing. Um, so, and they tested a, a number of different uh, groups um, in um, different combinations. Low, this is the first and second dose. So low dose, first dose, uh, low dose, low concentration of the virus, uh, second dose, and then low placebo, high dose, high dose, high dose, uh, nothing, and then uh, nothing, nothing, basically placebo, placebo. So there are, so as I'm pointing here with my um, pointer, they have tested both the single dose, low dose, single dose, high dose, and then double, double uh, of the, both com uh, combinations. And we don't have yet um, all of the data available for uh, what's more effective first versus uh, second or um, both uh, doses. And the most frequent side effects uh, reported so far uh, include uh, very similar side effects as we have seen with the other vaccines. Um, and the neutralizing antibody titers um, stayed up until 100% by day 57. And so that's how we are getting the 60 day mark um, with this uh, adenovirus based uh, vaccination so far. Yeah, like um, so our, our, our take home message is do not wait. <laughs> it may end up being a two dose vaccine anyway. Um, we know that our current vaccinations with the mRNA Moderna and Pfizer vaccines have really good effectiveness data so far good durability that they last um, and relatively safe side effect profiles with no um, other than a rate of anaphylaxis that might be slightly higher than the flu vaccine, but still pretty, pretty low. They're very effective and safe. And if you're 65 and older, you are eligible with most healthcare systems now or the County of Santa Clara, which we'll talk about in a minute. So don't wait, get yeah. your vaccine. <laughs> get what you can when you can get it is our- yeah. Exactly, yeah. exactly. I agree. Um, and just to say that a 90% uh, efficacy rate comparing that to the flu vaccine, which is 40 it's much to better. Like, I think that's why the scientific community is just straight up giddy about it because we've rarely had a vaccine that's this effective. 
Absolutely, it's great news. Um, there's a question about, can you comment on vaccine effectiveness on people taking prednisone? The Moderna vaccine, people could be part of the study, even if they were on prednisone up to 20 milligrams per day. So if people are on relatively low, low to medium doses of prednisone, it was still effective, but we didn't have a large number of people in that category. Um, so we don't know for sure, but it's still very highly recommended. It's expected to be very effective, even in people who have to take immune suppressing drugs like prednisone or some of the cancer therapies. Mm -hmm. um, so right. you can talk to your own doctor if you have a specific condition mm -hmm. about to ask, will my, this medication interfere? And they can help you answer that, but they're going to recommend you get it anyway. Yeah, there were some questions about, uh, you know, diabetes medicines and chronic diseases and whether or not you should get the vaccine. And the answer is yes. Um, yes. For folks who have controlled chronic uh, conditions, that includes people who have diabetes, heart disease, even HIV, even cancer, um, the vaccine is safe and effective. Um, it if you are, um, if you have an immunosuppressive disease, and I think as Dr. Martin said, and you are taking sort of special immunosuppression for it, um, it's worthwhile checking in with your rheumatologist or your primary care doctor, um, and just to, to, if you want to cross your T's and dot your I's. Um, but I think the general sense is that they have tested this on a, a number of people with a whole swath of medical conditions, and, and it's been proven to be safe and effective. And because those same medical conditions increase the risk of getting severe COVID and dying from COVID, it's actually, especially people who have um, cancer or immune suppressing conditions should get vaccinated. Mm -hmm. um, Bob Shaw is asking, is there a way to determine whether the vaccine has been effective after we've received our second dose? And the short answer is no. Um, uh, not really. I mean, we can, you can check for antibodies to the vaccine, but basically everybody makes them. Um, so there's not really an, a, a useful test. Um, Meg Gordon has a great question. Sorry, I'm rushing through these, but I wanna make sure we get to everybody's questions. Um, asking what strategies were used to defeat the 1918 pandemic? Would any of those be affected against, effective against COVID? Great question that I don't really know the answer to other than there were um, definitely some of the public health strategies, including quarantine um, and isolation, which you know many people in this group maybe saw in use with polio as well before there were widely available vaccines. So some of those strategies I'm sure were used, um, but I don't know otherwise, and they did not have vaccination. Mm -hmm. um, and so effectively that virus burned through the population and caused millions of deaths. Mm -hmm. um, um, and I think just to uh, make a note about the, uh, when you're protected from the vaccine, um, the best data we have is that it's two weeks after the second dose um, is when you sort of reach the maximum protection. Um, and so that's sort of the marker I would sort of feel a little bit more comfortable about a level of protection. There's a question about, um, uh, I think someone's loved one had gotten uh, 60 milligrams of prednisone once on Sunday and should she get the vaccine? It's a really good question. I think mainly, um, I think it really depends on um, how long she had taken the medicine. I think that's probably one that's worth checking um, with her doctor about. The take home point of immunosuppression with the vaccines is really that um, the, it's because people on high doses of prednisone uh, for a long period of time um, had not been studied to sort of look at their immune response. The concern is that their immune response wouldn't be as strong. But I think if your loved one had just taken sort of one dose of 60 milligrams of prednisone, that's probably okay. Yeah. There's another great question here about what if you've had COVID? You just had a positive PCR test for COVID, the nasal swab test. Should you go ahead and be vaccinated? The recommendations from the CDC are to wait 14 days after your positive test before you get vaccinated. And that yes, you should be vaccinated anyway, even if you've had COVID, um, because we believe that the immune response from the vaccine is stronger than that imparted by natural infection. So it is worth getting vaccinated. 
the truth is with limited supply, um, and that was part of the question Carl asked, uh, the rates of reinfection in the 90 days after a COVID infection are really, really low. So potentially you could wait. Um, on the other hand, I think I would go ahead and get it if you are in the known group who is 65 and older, who if you do get COVID again someday, it could be really bad. So my recommendation would be to go ahead and get it um, because if you are 65 and older, you are at higher risk of getting serious disease at some point. So don't wait. Dean <laughs> um, asked a really good question about what can we yeah. do after the vaccine, hold the grandkids, meet with friends. Um, um, and that's a really good question. Um, and really we'll talk question. a little bit about that as well um, in the later part of the presentation. But the take home is that, um, you know, even with the vaccine, it's important to still do the social distancing measures if we can with the masking and social distancing. Um, we know that there's a great protection for symptomatic COVID, um, meaning that people who got the vaccine versus the placebo were tested if they had symptoms to see if they were positive for COVID. Um, so um, suffice to say that there were still a number of people who did have symptomatic COVID that was positive, that 5%. And suffice to say that we don't quite yet have all the data about folks who were asymptomatic, did not have symptoms and sort of transmissibility there. And so really um, the, so when we can declare it to be truly safe to resume life as normal is when we have our wider population, sort of everyone, at least 60% of everyone get the vaccine. That's when we build what scientists called herd immunity. We build population immunity to COVID. Um, so if you can, um, you know, still doing the social distancing measures is important. Yeah. Our public health officials will track this extremely closely and know that there's a lot of reasons we want our lives to return to normal, um, but they will be our best guide. I think um, that's really public health 101. <laughs> so that is their wheelhouse. They know this kind of thing. Maybe we'll go ahead and start on my next part, um, which does answer some of the questions about getting the vaccine. Um, all right. So a lot of you may have seen this in the newspaper about who's eligible for vaccine now. Um, and this is according to the CDC and the California Department of Public Health also gets to kind of interpret the CDC recommendations around who, it, who gets it first. Um, I put the, the figure on the right because it is, has been a moving target. And um, even as we speak, the state of California is moving to simplify this, um, this tier system to be more age-based. Since age is the strongest risk factor for severe disease, um, they might simplify this further and just keep letting lower and lower age groups get vaccinated. Um, right now, a lot of uh, healthcare workers, especially traditional ones like physicians, nurses, um, et cetera, have been vaccinated at least with their first dose, many their second dose, um, and long-term care residents too. We'll show, I'll show you some info on that in a minute. Um, and the state has given permission to open up for individuals 65 and older, um, and is trying to figure out um, how to incorporate, um, how to get this vaccine fairly to people in education, childcare, emergency services like EMTs and ambulance workers, firefighters and people who work in the food and agriculture system, but definitely it is open for people 65 and older per the state. And if you go to the next slide, um, that then has to get reinterpreted by the county. Um, and the counties are the ones receiving the vaccines from the state of California. So the federal government sends it to the state, the state sends it to the county. And because the County Department of Public Health um, that receives these vaccines is also very busy doing um, contact tracing, responding to outbreaks, um, education campaigns, monitoring what types of virus and variants are going on. They have a lot going on. They in turn have delegated much of the vaccination to healthcare systems, big ones in particular like Stanford, Palo Alto Medical Foundation and Kaiser. Um, 
And then each of these places then may slightly, depending on, on their situation, may slightly tweak who they consider eligible right now. And so as of yesterday, and this could be, this could have even changed this morning because this tends to change very quickly. Um, basically all of the health systems and the Santa Clara County, and I believe San Mateo County as well, are providing vaccine for people who work in healthcare and people who work, live in long-term care, um, particularly skilled nursing facilities. Although assisted living and independent living uh, communities have increasingly been getting vaccine as well. Um, and healthcare personnel here, and this is relevant to many of us, um, includes um, uh, people who are caregivers, whether they are paid, sorry, whether they are paid privately and hired privately or through, um, or through an agency or through in-home supportive services through Medicaid. All Medi-Cal, all of those um, caregivers are considered healthcare personnel and should be getting vaccinated now. Um, Kaiser and Palto Medical Foundation, as of yesterday night, um, were offering vaccine appointments to people 75 and older, whereas the county and Stanford um, are offering to people who are 65 and older. All of this depends on any given day on vaccine supply. And that has been erratic and unpredictable. Um, it sounds like there have been some changes in the uh, Biden administration so that going forward, states will have more notice on when they will receive vaccine supply. Otherwise, so far it's been one week they'll get, you know, 50,000 doses and one week they'll get zero. And that's made it extremely hard to plan these vaccination events. It's made it hard on counties. It's made it very hard on all of our healthcare systems as well. To find the latest summary of who is scheduling and to get to the web link that allows scheduling or to the phone number to allow you to schedule, please see these websites on the bottom for Santa Clara County. I'm sure San Mateo County has analogous ones um, if you live in San Mateo County. Um, but basically it's, uh, there's an English version of the website and then a website that has Spanish, Vietnamese, Mandarin and Tagalog as well. So please feel free to look there. It's getting updated regularly. Next slide. Um, so the Stanford option, which is the one I can speak to the best. So um, they're offering, we get, we're getting both Pfizer and Moderna uh, vaccine and um, People who have received care at Stanford Healthcare at least once in the last three years and are age 65 and older and who live in Santa Clara County, San Mateo County, Alameda County or Contra Costa County are all being allowed to schedule as well as the healthcare workers who work in any of those counties. Um, and those are the, you can book online or call that phone number if you fit into that category. The reason why it's people who live in those counties is because um, of agreements with the counties to get vaccine supply. Currently, mo almost all of the vaccine that Stanford has to give comes from Santa Clara County. We have a little bit from Alameda and we've made um, agreements with San Mateo and Contra Costa counties that if we use uh, one of the doses that they've provided us for a resident of San Mateo County, that San Mateo County will then pay a dose back to Santa Clara County. That's how messy this whole thing is. We do not have agreements like that yet with San Francisco County. So we have patients of ours who live in San Francisco who we cannot schedule yet for vaccines. And it's been incredibly difficult and heartbreaking and frustrating. Um, and each day there are conversations between Stanford healthcare leaders and I'm sure Kaiser and PAMP as well and counties. Um, Kaiser and, Pal and Sutter, uh, which owns Palo Alto Medical Foundation, are statewide organizations. They actually get their vaccine supply from, directly from the state. Stanford is not considered a multi-county statewide organization, even though we do have patients in multiple counties and hospitals in two different counties. Um, they are considering us small enough that they actually are making ours go through the county. So it is labyrinthine. <laughs> it is definitely a mess. Um, so that's why we encourage people to try and get your appointment as soon as possible and take advantage of any opportunity because this is changing every day. And if you have a chance, get the vaccine. Next slide. How is vaccine rollout going? 
Um, well, about 1% of the United States population has had two full doses. Um, most of those are healthcare workers or residents of skilled nursing facilities. Um, you can see here, California is kind of in the mid range of people who've gotten at least one vaccine, somewhere around 6%. We have a lot of people to vaccinate. So some of the states that have gone faster and are a little bit further ahead are much smaller uh, populations. Next slide. Santa Clara County also keeps a vaccine dashboard um, going. And um, as you can see, the major groups that have been administering vaccines so far include the county itself. Um, and then Stanford Healthcare, um, Kaiser and Palo Medical Foundation. Um, just so you know, um, when first doses are planned, a second dose is saved or, or given a second dose is saved. So at all times there's planning for second doses. So we do not anticipate, there, we are doing that on purpose so that people will, can still get two doses. So um, we're not giving away all of our first doses and then we'll have no second doses. If you get a first, there is a second waiting for you. That is part of the way um, these are being administered. A um, couple federal part, uh, programs exist. So the VA has its own federal program. So it's not being reported through that same system but they're definitely administering vaccine. Um, the other big group um, that is receiving vaccine not through the county or healthcare systems but through a direct federal program are people who live in long-term care. Um, so primarily that's skilled nursing facilities, which unfortunately have seen the worst um, and saddest uh, damage from this vaccine, um, both in terms of residents and, uh, and staff. Um, fortunately, at the end of December, the long-term care program started rolling out. And this is a federal pharmacy partnership between CVS and Walgreens um, and states and counties, um, some one state decided to opt out and that was West Virginia. And they handled uh, the administration of vaccine in their nursing homes all by themselves um, and did a beautiful job. They were the first to get fully vaccinated. Uh, LA County also opted out of this federal pharmacy partnership program and their department of public health is handling their vaccinations and they haven't been quite as great but very different scenario because they've been in the middle of an enormous surge at the same time. Um, the great news is that about 90% of all U.S. nursing homes have had at least their first vaccine clinic through this partnership. Um, people, some people de decline and don't want the vaccine, but studies show and experience talking to many nursing homes and, and where I work as well are that most residents do want this vaccine as soon as possible. And so we've actually gotten um, the many, many, many long-term care residents vaccinated. You can see 2.75 million doses have been given in long-term care. Um, and then about 200,000 as of a couple days ago um, had already received two doses of the vaccine. Many places have their second dose within the next two weeks. Um, so we're getting much closer and actually we're seeing a decline in infections in nursing homes in general that probably partly mirrors the decline in, nurse, in, uh, in the state in our cases, but it seems to be a pretty sharp decline. So we're already seeing some major benefits from this, thank goodness. Um, so that's very exciting. Assisted living is, is a second wave of this federal pharmacy partnership and independent living communities. Some of you may live in some of these communities um, locally where they are part of this partnership and Walgreens or CVS is coming in to administer the vaccines there. Um, so about 23% of these communities as of a couple days ago had begun their vaccination programs. So hopefully over the next month, um, that will become much more widespread and people in congregate living environments that are at higher risk for spread um, will be more fully vaccinated. So this is all good news. It's taken longer than we hoped, but it's getting there. So we're very grateful. Next slide. Um, Stanford posts a, a, a vaccination dashboard as well. So um, we have vaccinated about 25,000 people who work at Stanford Medicine. Um, and lots of them have received both doses already. So that's great news. Um, also in terms of safety, if you get and in, go into the hospital, um, or clinic that your provider and nurse um, are probably double vaccinated already, thank goodness. And we are, we are pivoted much more now to community vaccinations and setting up multiple vaccine clinics um, 
for our patients and new ones open up daily. Hopefully in a couple of weeks, there's going to be one opening up at Stanford's Redwood City location that will be a park, park and go where people can go and stay in their car um, and get vaccinated and park and then be monitored for the required 15 or 30 minutes after the dose of vaccine um, and then be able to leave from there. Um, the uh, advantage of that is for people who are really somewhat um, homebound or wheelchair bound, often they can transition to a car, but they may not easily be able to then get out of a car um, and go into a clinic to get a vaccine and get back into the car. Um, so hopefully this will be a more accessible option for some of our patients who really struggle to leave home. Um, for people who are truly homebound, there is not yet a system available um, that we found if they're living at home, not in a facility. All right, next slide. So I imagine we have lots and lots of questions coming up now. Um, maybe I'll uh, ask our team here to, some of them are privately to me, so I'll find those, but, um, but Dr. Mao, Dr. Park, uh, yeah. questions that you wanna bring forth. Stop sharing my screen here and take a look at the questions. Okay. Um, I do see a question about uh, those of us uh, privately to me. Those of us 65 and older have many vaccines to take. So should we space them out uh, like shingle shots? I think that's one of our FAQs today, right? Yes. Um, Dr. Paul, so, can you take that question. What's that? Should I go ahead and take that one? Oh, I was asking. Oh. Uh, yeah, either one, Dr. Martin or Dr. Oh. Um, the recommendation basically is to wait 14 days between vaccinations. Um, I would recommend delaying on all other shots until you've gotten both COVID vaccines and then wait two weeks after your COVID vac second dose of COVID vaccine before getting another vaccine. Um, that's not because we think there will be an interaction, but it's because we don't know. Um, and so they're, they're just saying, safest to just not give them together. So that's what I would recommend. Most of those other vaccinations are not a terrible rush, so it's okay to wait. Mm -hmm. Oh, lots of questions about running short on vaccine. Yeah. <laughs> yes, very good questions. Um, so that is something that um, we just don't know for sure. And I know it does come up in the news a lot and they're, they're they are ramping up production. Um, we may yet have some doses of the Janssen pharmaceuticals, although it's gonna be at least a month and it doesn't seem like they're set up for major production, but Moderna is ramping up. Um, so right now on a day-to-day -day basis, some places ha have quite a bit of vaccine and some don't. <laughs> um, the county still has quite a bit. They're setting up some mass vaccination sites, which is wonderful, including one at the Mountain View Community Center. All of that's available through that um, SCC vaccination uh, website. So um, right now it's, it's, it's really a, a moving target. So Kaiser may have a, appointments one day and not the next. Same with Stanford, or they may be booking out two weeks and then suddenly they have all the ability to start up a community vaccination center and that's the place to go. So it does require a lot of tenacity and patience to keep looking for these vaccine sites in, unless you live in a, a community that's providing them. Ladies, can I ask that you address Sandy? She's had her oh. hand up for quite a while. And oh, I've I don't see hands, I'm so it's sorry. It's to, to follow everybody, but. Oh Sandy, gosh, so yeah, Sandy, I see Sandy, I don't know if you wrote your question or if you wanna come on screen and ask your question. Is she, are people able to unmute? Um, yeah, I, well, I don't know. Kat, can you I don't unmute? think they are. I think I they can have to allow, type here. Yeah, I can allow people to unmute. She, um, can, she can unmute Sandy. She can do one-on-one. -on -one. So okay, you go ahead. Thank you. I think you're unmuted. I'm wondering about the safety of getting a cortisone shot in my shoulder. I've already had one of the Moderna vaccines. The second one is in the middle of February. Mm -hmm. Can I can I get a safe cortisone shot without interfering with the efficacy of the vaccine? And thank you. Yeah, it's a really good question, Sandy. Thanks for asking. Um, to the best of our knowledge, yes, um, the cortisone shot. It's more um, if 
I imagine it's more sort of towards a shoulder or a joint. Mm -hmm. so that's more of a shoulder, local, yes. Yeah, so it's more of a local um, response. And so that won't sort of uh, hamper your immune system from responding to the vaccine. So you should definitely be able to get the second Moderna vaccine shot. Thank you so much. Yeah. I've been worried. Okay, thank Go you. Go for it. Um, yeah. Similarly, Sharon, no known um, reason to avoid anesthesia during this vaccine process. You can get anesthesia and have surgery, colonoscopies, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, there should be no interaction. Procedures. Okay. They answered my question. Great. Great. <laughs> Rosalinda asked a good question about um, um, addressing unmet needs of farm workers who are usually left out of the healthcare system, um, even though they put food well, on tables. Um, and so uh, that's a really good question, Rosalinda, sort of thinking about the equity of vaccine distribution. Um, what I know is that for folks who don't have uh, a primary care appointment, they can go to their county um, and see if they can schedule for a vaccine. I don't know that's, much further. Yeah. Currently only an option if they're 65 or older as a farm worker. Got it. Um, unfortunately, but you bring up a really great point, which is that the systems of delivery of the vaccine need to account for the fact that not everybody is on my health or on the computer, not everybody speaks English, um, and not everybody has easy access or could leave during work uh, hours to get a vaccine. Um, and so fortunately, there, there are definitely discussions about this, including at Stanford, is how can we partner with groups that work in communities like this, um, whether they're farm workers um, that have a large proportion of people who don't speak English or um, you know, neighborhoods in East Palo Alto, um, just across the highway. You know, um, Probably um, the county will lead a lot of these efforts um, in getting vaccine to clinics and organizations that work with these communities. And places like Stanford and other volunteers will provide the labor. <laughs> um, so that's the hope. Um, but all of it's kind of in the works right now since we're not yet in that phase of being able to vaccinate them. It's all in planning stages. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Martin, I don't know if you know immigration status or anything like that affects mm -hmm. Vaccine. It does not fully okay. available regardless of uh, immigration status. Great. Um, um, so Carl is saying that his wife lit, uh, has been in a long-term care facility that did have a, a limited outbreak there. Why is there no rapid response capability to move in quickly and vaccinate all contacts like hotspot teams for wildfires? It took a month before CVS gave the first dose by which time 35 people were affected with six deaths. This exact thing, I don't know if your wife was in our facility, but where I work, this happened as well. And we tried getting them to speed up the vaccination delivery to and scheduling of our vaccine clinic and were unable to do so. So I think the advantage of doing it the way LA County's been doing it and the way that West Virginia does it is that they've been flexible locally to be able to ramp up where needed first. With the CVS and Walgreens program, that has not been an option. They consider everybody first come first serve, basically. Carl also asked a question. Do you think it's reasonable that there's no mechanism for vaccinating over 65 people with various seri serious respiratory or other disease? I realize it's complicated logistically, but seems unfair to those already struggling to stay alive. I wonder if this is a similar um, question, Carl. It's unclear to me if it's folks ages 65 or above, in which case I think they can get um, vaccinated um, even if they have a respiratory illness. But if we're yeah. talking about sort of the number of people who have illness and not having a response fast enough, we share your frustration yeah. in that. Just like with flu, we're not giving the vaccine if somebody has a fever currently, um, we wait until it's, it's resolved. Um, does Stanford ensure that those who have appointments will get the vaccine or is there a risk that the vaccine might not be available for any given appointment? Um, so far, we have not had to cancel any appointments at Stanford due to lack of having the vaccine available. So they've been really good so far about not having either um, running out or um, having excess doses because they have an on-call list um, so that no doses get wasted. Great. Um, There's a good question about um, is it true that mRNA vaccine a piece can get detached and cause immunological problems and even 
um, cancer afterwards? That's a really good question. Um, no, that is not true. Um, the mRNA vaccine, again, just um, makes the little spike proteins to sort of alert our immune system to um, remember um, that when a true virus comes along um, to know how to fight it, um, there's no data or evidence uh, that the mRNA um, stays around or changes our DNA or can cause other immunological issues or, or malignancies later on. Yeah. See, Michael's asking, can we pick or prefer the type of vaccine? So Moderna versus Pfizer, I'm guessing is the question. The short answer is no. <laughs> and I don't recommend that either. Um, there's no evidence that one's really better than the other. So um, please uh, do get whichever one you can get. <laughs> um, they're very similar efficacy, similar me identical mechanism of action. So they should be fine. Um, let's see, is there a way to get on the Stanford on-call list? Not really. Um, it's basically, they're doing it by age um, and, and their clinic and it's random. <laughs> it's not even, there's no list so much as just like a process that's like, okay, going through our, our primary care patients. But there's a question about, are the are Moderna and Pfizer currently working on updating the vaccine to incorporate protection from COVID variants? Um, I know that was one of the uh, questions that Dr. Park um, had put in her FAQ. Dr. Park, do you want to take that question? Oh, Dr. Park, you're still muted. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay, yeah. So as usual, I like to show evidence. So um, here is the, it was actually just published in Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory uh, two days ago, uh, at least the Moderna vaccine uh, being tested against the mutant variants that are around um, the UK variant, as well as a, uh, the more severe kind, South African variant B1351. Um, and the Moderna vaccine seemed to be um, as immunogenic as it can be against the UK variant, um, but there was a reduced response um, in trying to neutralize the B1351 South African slash Brazilian uh, SARS-CoV-2 variation. So, you know, studies are underway definitely, and I'd be surprised if Pfizer isn't doing the same thing. Yep, agreed. Nice about this technology, easy to switch out to a variant. It's not that hard, which is great. Um, Michael's asking, should you have the, do you need to have both first and second dose be the same? So both Moderna and both Pfizer? Yes. Um, with, ex with exceptions, <laughs> basically. So the World Health Organization is saying, yes, absolutely. The CDC, C CDC is saying yes, um, but rather than not get the second dose, if that's all that's available, go ahead and get the other one. So if you got Pfizer and there's only Moderna, then get Moderna. There's a question about does the Moderna vaccine second dose have to be exactly 28 days after the first dose or at least 28 days is okay? And how far can one go? Um, it's a really good question. Uh, I think from what I've seen, generally, they don't want the second dose to be given um, uh, too early. So more than uh, four days early is a little too early. And then I would say about sort of a week-ish afterwards um, is is how, how they've been able to space yeah. them. Yeah. And the CDC so, so far, oh, go ahead. No, no, no. I was going to say the same. Go ahead. Yeah, the CDC so far um, does not recommend missing that window of scheduled first and second doses, you know, with the scheduled times, um, but it can be scheduled for up to 42 days after the first dose. So six weeks is a maximum uh, time limit um, that you want to have the second dose be administered. But if you're outside that 42 day window, there's no data to really show that it might be effective, but still go ahead and schedule your appointment and get the second dose um, if you can. Yep, exactly. Although it's not recommended to do it outside that window. Yeah, Yeah, because we just, nobody in the studies went more than 42 days in between their doses. So we just don't know. We'll know more as more and more people get the vaccine and the real life situation of people who couldn't get vaccine until later will come up. Um, plus there will be ongoing studies. So hopefully we'll get more information on that. Marlene's asking, my mother had adverse reactions to the flu and shingle shots. She's 86 years old and is concerned about having an adverse reaction to the COVID vaccine. She's thinking of not getting that, getting it. Is that a good idea? 
So unless her adverse reaction was anaphylaxis, then I would, in which case she should talk to an allergist before she gets the COVID vaccine. I would highly recommend getting the COVID vaccine anyway, because although it's uncomfortable to have adverse reactions and not feel great for a few days, it will not kill you. We've had nobody killed <laughs> even by anaphylaxis. Um, from these vaccines, whereas COVID very well might. Um, and people over 80, the mortality rates are, are awful. And, and it's for those who get really sick and survive it, it's awful. So that I can guarantee is horrible, whereas the adverse reaction will be temporary and uncomfortable. So I highly recommend getting it anyway. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, is there a well-designed post-marketing study to watch for long-term problems into the future and who is doing it? Yes, there is a vaccine adverse event reporting system um, that's being that's very um, well established and will continue to measure all vaccine uh, adverse effects. I think there are also there's also post-marketing surveillance going on through the companies and through universities. So we will know more. Um, what is the time period to get the second dose? So for the Moderna vaccine, it's recommended to get it four weeks after your second, after your first dose. Um, but there is some data up to six weeks, but really highly recommended if you can to get, get it at, uh, at four weeks. And then for Pfizer, it was studied uh, three weeks. So that's what's recommended. Great. And I think there were some questions about um, if there will be a summary um, of this information provided later on. Um, we're happy to share the slides. I think they're recorded. And I think either it was Paula or Kat that said that you guys would provide a closed captioning um, version of these slides if I read that correctly. Yes, uh, this will be, this is currently being recorded. We will send this out as soon as it becomes available to everyone who has signed up. Great. A question on, does the entire development of vaccines start over from the beginning for any new booster for new variants? Not necessarily. I mean, yes, in some ways, the technology um, doesn't have to be redeveloped. They just change the recipe a little bit to match the new variant. Um, but the studies to check for effectiveness, yes, they start over at phase one um, in the same like sped up version that happened with this vaccine is planned for on um, the South Africa variant, um, Moderna vaccine is, Moderna is doing a, starting a phase one trial of a modified um, mRNA vaccine for that South, South Africa variant starting with phase one. Um, Paula asked, what is your strategy for advising a resistant household member to obtain a vaccine if they reside in a group household? Um, that's a really good question, Paula. I think I would start by asking sort of what their biggest concerns are. Um, people uh, have a lot of concerns and sometimes um, feel even more sort of staunchly resistant um, if they feel like those concerns are dismissed. And so I think um, really speaking as objectively as possible um, to what their concerns are um, and then sort of, you know, uh, their values of, you know, what um, sort of what are the outcomes um, if, you know, sort of what the paths ways are forward in terms of, you know, is the concern outweighing um, the consequences of getting COVID or having other members of the household get COVID. I see a there question here from, um, I'm not sure, EP108. I thought I heard Norway has a nursing home or something where a lot of older patients died after the vaccine. Not sure of the details. Can you comment on use in elderly frail patients? Um, so I'm not sure, I, I didn't hear this story and you have to be really careful about the stories you find as we all know on the internet because many of them are not uh, necessarily true or have a weird slant. Um, I don't know what vaccine they're using in Norway if it's Moderna or other um, or Pfizer or some other technology but probably it's Moderna or Pfizer. What I do know is we've vaccinated 2.2 frail older residents of 2.2 million frail older residents of the United States in nursing homes and not one has died of the vaccine. So um, I'm not sure what that story is, but that our real life experience in the United States, this is not happening and people are dying of COVID. Yes, sadly, many have, um, but not of the vaccine. 
I, I think I can bunch up two questions that are related to um, allergies. Chico says, um, is a two week in between apply also for allergy shots? And um, as Dr. Martin uh, said as well, I think the two week uh, um, in between rule applies for all shots actually. So if you, you are getting these allergy shots to get tested for what kind of allergen you're immunogenically responding to, um, then all the more reason to space out this um, COVID vaccination two weeks out from whenever you have the allergy shots um, being taken. And so um, just like the other shingles vaccine or the flu vaccine, um, any other vaccine shouldn't really be uh, in between the windows of between the first and second doses, at least two weeks out uh, from either the first or second dose. And then there was another question from Carol Lee. Um, she says, I carry an EpiPen. I have had an anaphylactic reaction. Is there a problem with either vaccine? Um, and so this, the anaphylactic reaction is a little bit tricky. Um, and so it depends on what vaccination and what component um, within that vaccination um, you've had an anaphylactic reaction to. And this is something that you probably have to consult your PCP for at least uh, to decide, you know, is it worth going forward with getting the vaccination if you've had a prior anaphylactic reaction. Um, so my answer is, I'm not sure. I, I'm, I think that I would cons uh, consult um, either an allergist or at least your PCP to go through what are the risks um, of the anaphylactic reaction uh, being it, leading into mortality um, versus getting the benefit of um, evading COVID by getting the vaccination. Most vaccine sites will have EpiPens available and the, when you do get the vaccine, they will ask you for both doses to sit and wait uh, for 15 minutes to be observed and monitored because that's- Actually 30 if you have a history of allergic, so plan yeah. ahead. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, if you've had anaphylaxis, they'll monitor you for at least 30 minutes after. But that's kind of a good safeguard that you'll have professionals there who will be watching and monitoring. Rosalinda asked a really great question. How, how can we get in touch with people who want to volunteer to reach underserved Spanish populations? Um, uh, I think that that's a really wonderful uh, thing to be thinking about, Rosalinda. I, I don't know any sort of direct um, organizations off the top of my head, um, but I think from uh, a public health effort and community organizations, they'd probably be the most um, uh, on the ground in terms of their communities um, and where the help is needed. Um, and I will just sort of put a plug and say that um, it is really important um, as you guys get information and as you start, start getting the vaccines, um, it's important to talk to your individual spheres of influence uh, about your understanding of the vaccines and what your experience is, because a lot of people are looking towards the people around them to see, you know, are you going to get a vaccine or how did you feel? Um, as you can imagine, there's so much public um, misinformation out there that uh, that the more we can do as a community um, within our own communities is important. Um, I just looked up uh, some new some information on the Nor Norway, um, and it does look like there were a number of people who died after receiving the vaccine, but they don't think that that number was out of line with the number of deaths, um, average deaths in nursing homes. It wasn't all in one nursing home. Um, in their country, um, so both the world that would normally occur. So yes, people died after receiving the COVID-19 vaccine. I had a patient pass away this week who got vaccinated 10 days ago, but he died of something else that was long expected. So that does happen in nursing homes because of our frail population and both the World Health Organization and all the public health organizations and the, Brit and the country and British Medical Journal refuted that it was due to the vaccine. It was actually just normal rates, sadly. Mm -hmm. um, I have a private question um, about, um, uh, I have a, had my first dose of the Pfizer vaccine. My husband who has underlying health concerns cannot get the vaccine yet. Although I may not come down with symptoms, I understand I may still be asymptomatic. Can I pass the coronavirus on to him at home? Um, super great question. Um, I think, Again, we don't have the exact data on asymptomatic transmission uh, of COVID even after vaccination. So there is still a risk there, um, which is why uh, sort of the same precautions of masking and um, distancing is important when we're interacting and going out of the home um, to the community to prevent 
uh, contracting COVID. Uh, we do know that the vaccine does confer some protection against transmission overall um, because it's prevented COVID. Um, but I think sort of exactly how much and um, for how long I think remains to be seen, especially as we get more data from a population level. We are getting a little bit close to 1230. So I just wanted to give everyone a little warning. Um, I think we could take another couple of questions and that should and then we should uh, focus on wrapping it. There was one question I saw and didn't get to answer about somebody who's 63 and cares for an, a person over, um, who's I think 80 maybe, who has uh, Alzheimer's and can he or she get the vaccine. Um, currently family caregivers are not in the approved list, unfortunately, hired caregivers are. Um, so regardless of age, they're, Hired caregivers tend to be higher risk because they live in their own home, usually. Sometimes they live with the, with the patient, but often live in their own home, may work with multiple um, clients and going from home to home. So they are very high risk. So in fact, many, sadly, a number of our patients that we've lost in my clinic had private caregivers who became COVID infected and brought it in um, to their home. So that is a group that I think is extremely important to vaccinate as soon as possible. Family caregivers, I would love to get them vaccinated as soon as possible because the burden on family caregivers can be extreme sometimes. And um, so I hope that very soon that will be possible and that we'll be lowering the age range soon to somewhere around 60 or 55. Um, so the, so yeah. Dr. Martin, the age range was lowered. That was, that was what was announced yesterday and this morning, CNN is that Yes, California says 65 plus as of today, but once again, it's getting access and are there vaccines available? But here's where advocacy helps by everybody online right now. If you send a letter to Joe Simidian, Mark Berman, your local politicians, you're 65, you're a caregiver, you have, you have health professionals coming into your home, you have a therapist, a physical therapist, a nurse, a professional care agency, you are basically running out of your home, your own little assisted or memory care facility. And um, you are, in my mind, a community health worker as I am. So I think, I think that as well planned as our society is that there are groups of people overlooked and those unfortunately are sometimes family caregivers. But I tell all my caregivers in my groups you have to advocate, I have to advocate. So I've been writing letters and I suggest everybody else write letters or pick up the phone to um, see if you can make move this along. Um, that's that's a thought, a to-do a to do item, an action item, so. Agreed. I think we can answer one last um, category that has to do with wearing masks. There are two questions. One um, about uh, thoughts on wearing two masks at once. And then there's another one um, that uh, no, someone else asked, uh, uh, can I use a cloth mask over a KN95? And if so, can I just swap out the cloth mask and continue to reuse the KN95 multiple times before it becomes ineffective? So the short answer to both of these questions is number one, social distancing is the best measure that you can have because it's all about preventing transmission um, and inhaling the viral particles that are sent off from, uh, from the air that are floating around. Um, but number two is to pro provide some sort of barrier that will uh, block the viral par particles from entering your respiratory tract itself. So um, I actually, when I was in New York, uh, when we had the shortage of the KN95s, uh, did the same thing as you were suggesting is to um, put multiple cloth or surgical masks over the KN95 and then throw out the cloth or surgical mask and then keep the N95. If you need to do that um, because of the scarcity of KN95 masks, please do so. But it's not, of course, advised because uh, the theory is that the viral particles get filtered out and will stay outside the mask. So every time you touch it, that's actually already contaminated. Um, and then so about wearing two masks at once, go ahead if that feels uh, you know more, more safe and comfortable. Um, if that gives you more security, I, I would, I would uh, recommend it. I don't think there's, you know, scientific conclusive evidence saying one mask versus three masks is more uh, effective, but um, wearing a mask is, is the most important thing. Exactly. <laughs> don't go without a mask and don't touch your mask too much if you can help. <laughs> okay. I think um, I just want to say thank you so much to the three of you for 
joining us today and donating your time. I know you're, you're very busy and we just so appreciate our um, partnership with the Stanford um, University Hospital and Medicine and the Medical School and just having these continuing partnerships. And I also wanna say, um, Dr. Marina Martin, I, I do see Dr. Martin frequently because she's in, our building's closed, but she does come in. We're um, <laughs> operating out of our building a, a PPE donation effort drive. And so occasionally Dr. Martin comes in, picks up some boxes and she drives them to a local assisted care community and um, in the middle of everything else she is doing. So thank you so much for joining us today. And I'm gonna throw this over to Kat right now because she has a few announcements to make and then so do I. So these will be quick. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Uh, this was incredibly informative. So thank you all of our doctors for joining us and having a panel and, and this discussion and answering all of these questions. Um, like I said at the beginning of the meeting and uh, throughout the meeting, we have recorded this. So we can send this to anyone who wants to rewatch it or send it to any of your loved ones. It will also be on our website um, later this afternoon, I believe. Um, I'm not so sure about the slides. I got a few questions about that, but I know for sure that the video will be on our we'll website. We'll get those to you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, we will be having another town hall next month as well. Um, it will be on a different uh, topic than this. I know that we had a um, we had a lecture set up with a retired doctor, I think from Stanford, um, Dr. Lawrence Basso, who had a um, he had a topic in mind that was uh, very close to this one, but I'm not sure um, oh, if that's. Cat, I'll take it. Yes. Cat, yeah, I'll go take ahead. All of this. So. Um, we do, we have these amazing community partners. So this retired physician is gonna come on. He's lectured before, he has a huge turnout. He is a molecular biologist with a passion and he's gonna take a deep dive into the actual cell structure of COVID and the vaccine. And it's, um, we're just gonna say this, this is for science, older, elder science geeks who wanna come on and learn from this and ask questions. He loves doing this. So it's gonna be in our email blast. And then the next two town halls are um, in February, we're gonna uh, take a different direction. We're gonna have a family mediator come on because during this entire year, we've had so many difficulties with people isolated, staying at home long-term and having difficult conversations, not being on the same page. And I've, I've come to the conclusion that we need some guidelines for these conversations to come to what we call workable agreements with main, you know, navigating the rest of the pandemic alone at home together. And I, I have received phone calls on my crisis intervention line about more personal dynamics and communication. So family mediator, Menlo Park, Nicole Lance is gonna speak. And then March brings us full circle we're back with Dr. Ayati, who started our first town house in April. We're almost at a year. And um, I'm not quite sure exactly where that's when it's going to go, but I believe Dr. Ayati has what I call the State of the Union address, address on aging in America and caregiving. And since we'll probably have a State of the Union uh, address uh, at that time, I want, I've been pushing Dr. Ayati to do this. So I think it's going to happen. I'm going to talk to him about it. Um, he's testified in DC and California on challenges of aging in America involves caregiving and, I, and maybe it will be a Q&A conversation. I, I'm not quite sure, but he's gonna join us in March. And then after that, we may take a totally different direction with rebooting a series of talks we call the Care Forum with Dr. Ellen Brown and Dr. Wiedek Attack. And that has yet to be worked out. So we're always thinking of everybody in our community and we'll, we'll see where this goes next. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you for inviting us. Good to see everyone.